Presented by Caltech.
Caltech swings, huh? <laughs> Thank you, Barb Catlin and the Caltech Jazz Band. Barb is one of our new great additions to the Performing and Visual Arts Department at Caltech and another amazing colleague here. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. We're so happy that you are here tonight to support the arts at Caltech. Also to raise much needed funding for the arts and increasing our visibility in the community. And of course, to celebrate our dear, dear colleagues, Dolores and Bill Bing. Uh, my name is Brian Brophy. I'm head of the theater arts at Caltech. And tonight, you will experience a delightful sampling of the creative excitement that happens every day at Caltech, outside of the laboratories and the study groups and the lectures and the problem sets and the house life and all of that. So in theater arts, we offer students and the entire Caltech community opportunities to perform in shows. Thank you. <laughs> They're so friendly here. There's about two dozen people backstage, and there's about a hundred performers and singers and musicians backstage. It's really, really exciting. And I'm very proud to be here uh, in this most amazing space that Pavarotti called his most and best space to sing in all of Southern California, believe that or not. So in theater arts, we offer students and the entire Caltech community opportunities to perform in shows, 
write their own plays, learn all the tech aspects that they want to participate in our fourth annual festival of new science-driven plays, improvisation classes, play going, and our storytelling for scientists class now in its third year at Caltech that I'm so happy about. And tonight, I want you to give a nice warm round of applause for one of our storytelling for scientists our, from our new class. Uh, her name is Bianca Yang, class of 2019. Give it up for her. I have a fascination with uncertainty. I suspect that my fascination stems from the bag of uncertainty that has been my life. After almost 19 years of existence, I still don't know what I want to do, <laughs> how I want to change the world, let alone what I want to major in. The one thing that has remained certain is that I'm in love with uncertainty. Uncertainty is that untamable property of our universe that defines our existence. It is the untamable property that defines our financial markets, our diseases, our social interactions, and our progress. Uncertainty is the underpinning of good science, of innovation. In fact, uncertainty is our friend. Peter Thiel, one of the early investors in Facebook, laments, we wanted flying cars. Instead, we got 140 characters. What he's talking about is how we have shifted from backing truly transformative technologies like the space race and the computer to backing incremental technologies like underpowered hybrid cars and Expedia travel. He is lamenting the lack of robotic companions and colonies on Mars and teleportation devices. Where has our desire gone to create the next generation of technology? to challenge existing paradigms about the human experience? Have all our dreams been transformed into variations on big data? This is truly disappointing. Where have all the kids who asked why gone? Who did they grow up to be? Why have we lost our love for uncertainty and fallen into the trap that is risk aversion and risk avoidance? Why have we stopped searching for those points on the boundary between the known and the unknown, between the certain and the uncertain, where we can make a difference? Why have we stopped trying to change the world? Why? Over 50 years ago, science fiction writers dreamed up technologies like warp speed travel and the shrink ray and the DeLorean. They were applauded. They were applauded for thinking big for pushing forward the next generation of ideas that would transform humanity? Why haven't we been able to realize their dreams? Now, I don't mean to bash good companies like Google and Amazon and Facebook, because they've solved significant technological challenges. But I'm looking for the next big thing. I'm looking for the next big thing that will transform the way we get our food and the way we get ourselves places and the way we get our energy and the way we survive. Because our survival is dependent on us embracing the uncertainty that is written into the laws that govern our universe. You never know what the future will hold because it's up to you to create it. Thank you. I'm Dolores Bing. I direct the chamber music program at Caltech. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, 94 Caltech students played in chamber music groups this spring. They rehearsed in 27 autonomous groups of from two to five students each. With so many ensembles, each playing its own music, we required nearly eight hours of performance time on our year-end concert series. Last Sunday, for example, we pre uh, presented a four and a half hour chamber music marathon without an intermission. 
Now, now my idea of a perfect evening is listening to eight hours of chamber music. <laughs> but that may not be yours. So to prepare for this evening's event, we held a competition with judges from the Los Angeles musical community. They selected the three ensembles that you're going to hear on stage, and along with the students who played for you as you entered the auditorium and who are other students who will play for you at intermission, they all represent all of the students in Caltech Chamber Music. Thank you.
Thank you, Dolores. The Caltech Chamber Music. As you can tell, Dolores is a gifted teacher with a gentle touch and a consummate professional. She will be deeply missed. However, I think my favorite credit that she has is that she played cello on an Earth, Wind & Fire album. <laughs> yeah. um, the One second. <laughs> Drama people. <laughs> All right. Hit yes, you ready? Yeah. All right. 24 years of the Master Chorale and then the, the Philharmonic, Nancy Sulahian. The Caltech Glee Club is made up of students, alums, faculty, staff, and various other members of the Caltech community. These singers dedicate three hours a week to rehearsing together, building their vocal instruments, working on rhythms, phrasing, tuning, vowel blending, not easy, music reading, interpretation, learning to pronounce Latin, Italian, German, French, Russian, or the hardest of all to sing, <laughs> English, right? <laughs> Sounds rather technical for a bunch of people who really need a break from their scientific endeavors. But these Caltech folks were born to sing, as you are about to hear. You'll find it meaningful to turn in your program to pages eight and nine for translations of this evening's choral selections. We'll begin with two short pieces from the Italian Renaissance, sung by the chamber singers of the Caltech Glee Club.
felt so nice over here, I thought I'd come back just for a little moment. It is, it is such an honor for me to make music with these folks. A few of them had never sung in a choir until October when we first got together. Some of them, of course, are more seasoned choral musicians, but it's such a pleasure to hear how we begin at the very beginning and how far they come in a very short period of time. I could not be more, more pleased and honored to work with the, the spirits and the minds that you see in front of you. The, the next two pieces we're going to, to perform have a little something in common. They're kind of different sides of the same coin. That's not even true. First, we're singing Brahms, which is its, its own paper money, in fact, a credit card even. The Brahms that we're going to sing is based on a hymn tune and you'll hear the hymn tune sung variously uh, throughout the piece, the Cantus Firmus. And then there are several verses, and each verse has a different harmonic setting. And there's just wonderful counterpoint. And I think the Brahms will be very, very beautiful to your ears and to your hearts. And then two pieces sort of based on, um, on Mary and, and Eve, who are, again, those are the two sides of the same coin. Um, the, the Rachmaninoff is from the All Night Vigil, one of the several pieces uh, written for the Russian, Russian Orthodox liturgy. And this is the setting, the traditional setting of Ave Maria uh, in Church Slavonic, not Russian, but they sound about the same to me. Uh, and, then, and then the flip side is Ave Eva. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, the very famous text, of course, Ave Maria, if you take the Ave, which really means hey there, uh, or hail, um, and you, you turn it in, you, you flip it backwards, it's Eva. And so the final piece is Ave Eva, uh, hail Eve, uh, which, is, which is sort of an interesting take on uh, the female persona. Uh, we think she's a little, the next to last chord is a little bit, a little bit naughty, and so we give you two sides of, of Ave.
Caltech Glee Club, Nancy Shalah here. Last February, we premiered Boldly Go, <laughs> a musical parody based on Star Trek written by G4 in theoretical physics, Grant Remen and his brother Cole Remen. It turned out to be the most popular show in the Institute's history with over 2,000 people attending seven performances. Tonight, we will be performing a few songs for all of you, starting with Captain's Log, in which Captain Kirk, much to his <laughs> surprise, has failed to impress the lovely Carol Marcus. Oh, yes. Do you want to explain any of that? I mean... Well, Brian, it's like... No matter what I do, she seems more interested in the impending threat of an all-out war between the two most powerful nations in the galaxy. I mean, what about me? Huh? Aren't I just as important? <laughs> Captain's Lock. Personal entry. Tell me, what did I do wrong to merit your indifference while my heartache you prolong? Why can't you see a better catch? You won't find any place than this valiant starship captain boldly venturing through space. You don't know what you're missing, because I know I'm pretty rare. How many guys can sail the stars with perfect wavy hair? I'm the youngest starship captain. I'm the best spaceman on Earth. But you never realized what you had You never saw my worth As great as I know I am Can't help but second guess Cause though I seem invincible My heart is in distress Your words aren't gonna hurt me Via subspace telegram I just have to I can still recall the day, the very hour that we met At Starfleet in the springtime with the sun about to set You always were a smart one, always buried in your work You never seemed to have the time for me, your dashing Kirk So Carol, take a look now, see the man you're letting go don't leave my love so lightly, cause I doubt you'll ever know A guy on planet Earth or in this great big galaxy Who cares as much as I do, or who's anything like me As great as I know I am, can't help but second guess Cause though I seem invincible, my heart is in distress your words aren't gonna hurt me by a subspace telegram. I just have to remember I'm as great as I know I am. Now, as uh, all of you, most of you know, that Star Trek and Boldly Go follow the exploits of the Starship Enterprise, the uh, flagship of the United Federation of Planets. But what is the United Federation of Planets? Well, Brian, I'll tell you about it the only way I know how. By singing. <laughs> the United Federation a planet, a beacon in the night. May thy worlds ever turn, may 
May thy sons ever burn with liberty and light. Cause we stand for truth and justice. We stand with for knowledge. Truth. We're obsessed. We're obsessed. It's the Alpha Quadrant Enlightenment. We're pretty much the best of capitalist economics. No new currency. Nobody should quite how that all works. But hey, it works for me. The United Federation. United Federation. United Federation. United Federation. It's no sci fi fantasy. United Federation of Planets, we pledge to stand with thee. Thy banner unfurled for a thousand worlds across the to a scene with Dr. McCoy, the medical officer, cautioning the captain against some rather dangerous decisions that he has made, a course of action that was very dangerous. Now, you might recognize that iconic phrase familiar to all fans of Star Trek. Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor. <laughs> now, Bones, are you sure you're not letting your sometimes Overly cautious emotions affect your recommendation? Why, Jim, I'm merely being realistic. Are you accusing me of, of, of forming a medical opinion based purely on, on, on whimsy rather than fact? I'm a doctor, not a charlatan. Oh, come on now, Bones, you know Damn I'm Damn it, Jim! I am not the captain of this starship or its science officer. I'm not an astrophysicist or antimatter connoisseur. I don't get warp drive physics or transporter compensators. And I'm not a subspace monitor or alien translator. No, I'm not a random redshirt or security tactician. And I'm not a helmsman or lieutenant, but as the physician of this starship, it's my duty to alert you to the danger the radiation up ahead could make for a game changer. Jim, you know I'm not an engineer, a mooch, a tool conductor, not a botanist, historian, or memory chip inductor, and I'm not an escalator, or a doorstop, or a battery, and good thing you don't compliment, cause I'm immune to flattery, you know I'm just a doctor, not a viking, nor a saint, Jim, you know I can't work miracles, Hippocrates I ain't, I will answer questions medical, from any interlocutor through and through to do my bones, damn it Jim, I am a doctor! Yes, for I can cure a Klingon cold and vaccinate a Vulcan. I can battle Earth bacteria from Bismarck to the Balkans. I have earned the trust of Tellarites for tricky tonsillectomy. I've even given an Andorian an appendectomy. And once I had occasion to prescribe a gone an enema, my exploits with the latter being worthy of the cinema. For training, I interned with Dr. Fox, a great denobulan who taught me to distinguish albumin from pseudoglobulin. While Spock thinks I'm illogical, I think he's too naive. 
though I'm a doctor, not a diplomat or spy, I do believe that Klingon treachery is behind this, and we could be in grave peril. I just wish that Jim would see it, or at least just talk with Carol, because the radiation threat is here before our very eyes. So, Captain, you must now decide what fate awaits the Enterprise. It's my job to tend the wounded, to repair, rebuild, and heal, and so it's to your better judgment I've been trying to appeal. No, Jim, I am not a charlatan, witch doctor, or decoy, but I'm a genuine physician. Yes, sir, I'm the real McCoy. I've got three degrees in medicine, cosmic and terrestrial, and I can diagnose diseases common and celestial. For as a fount of knowledge, I'm a veritable oracle, frequently provide advice and phrases metaphorical to answer questions medical from any interlocutor through and through unto my bones. Damn it, Jim, I am a doctor. Warp speed! I am not the captain of the starship or its science officer. I'm not an astrophysicist or antimatter connoisseur. I don't get more physics or more sort of compensators. I don't touch on these monitor or alien translator. I'm not a random redshirt or security tactician. And I'm not a helmsman or lieutenant, but is the physician of the starship. It's my duty to alert you to the danger. The radiation up ahead could make for a game changer. No, Jim, I am not an engineer or moonshot or conductor, not a botanist, historian, or memory chip inductor, and I'm not an escalator or a doorstop or a battery. Good thing you don't compliment, because I'm immune to flattery. No, I'm just a doctor, not a Viking or a saint. Jim, you know I come with miracles, Hippocrates I ain't. I will answer questions medical from any interlocutor through and through to do my voice. Just damn it, Jim. I am a doctor. Damn it, Jim, I am a doctor.
Alan Gross. And the orchestra. Alan is a, another one of the, my colleagues here who is supremely talented and an exciting conductor. And his dedication to the students in Caltech is, is truly emblematic of all of my colleagues here at the Caltech campus. There's a, a few others who uh, are represented in my department, including Matt Elgart, who teaches classical guitar. There's Stuart Freed, who's in the audience tonight. Stuart teaches ceramics. And it is one of the classes at Caltech that's really hard to get into the door for because it's so popular. And of course, Jim Barry, when he is not in Africa, is here teaching silk painting, photography, watercolors, dabbling in virtual reality modalities, and computer art, and just an amazing group of, of professionals that I work with here at Caltech. Very, very exciting. Uh, we want to draw your attention to a few exciting ways that you can connect to the arts at Caltech. A special fund has been created, entitled appropriately, the Bing Fund for the Arts at Caltech, which was one way to honor our beloved Bill and Dolores Bing in tribute to their combined 75 years of devotion to Caltech. Yes. Please look in your program for more details. We also wanted to thank some very special guests who opened our concert this evening. The trumpet players who participated. Yeah. The trumpet players who participated in the opening fanfare are some of the very best trumpeters in Los Angeles and indeed in all of the country. They are colleagues, former students, and longtime friends of Bill Bing's. The piece was written by the legendary Dan Higgins to commemorate this event. Very cool. And in addition, the jazz band played a commissioned arrangement by Dan Higgins on one of Bill's favorite tunes, we think it is appropriately titled for tonight, Our Love is Here to Stay. Thank you to our special trumpet guests. Wow, there's so much organization that goes into making art, making music, we're so happy that you're here tonight. You're having a good time? Yeah? How are you guys upstairs? Woo! Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming out. A um, little bit more of business here. Uh, there is a Storytelling for Scientists Showcase coming up on Friday, June 3rd, 7.30 at the Ramo Auditorium. You will see 10 students from Caltech who have been with me for 10 weeks developing their own stories around their science passion. So if you're interested and you want to see this next generation of science communicators, please come down to Rainbow Auditorium on June 3rd. That's a Friday night at 7.30. It will be the concluding presentation for the storytelling uh, for scientists class. There is also an explicit show, which is a student-run co-curricular activity during the summer. We will be doing much ado about nothing, thank you. <laughs> and that will be, uh, the August 6th through the 13th on the weekends. What else? So, <laughs> um, 
What you're going to see coming up right now. Are you guys ready? Yes. Good, good. Uh, so let us move to our second storyteller. He is the class of 2019 as well. His name is Akshay Srivastava. Give it up for Akshay. <laughs> I think that most people would consider a passion for science to be a terminal illness. <laughs> that is, most people think that at some point in the young archetypal scientist's life, they're seized by this passion for science, this urge to explore the unknown for the betterment of humanity. The disease then subsequently drives them insane, forcing them to do nonsensical things every day like research for long hours, until eventually they die happily at their fume hoods holding a test tube and looking at a molecule that happens to be named after them. <laughs> I'm allowed to make jokes like that, by the way, because I go to Caltech. <laughs> but really, for once, most people actually got something right. People that have a passion for science do crazy things. They commit their lives to something that only a few people will ever be able to appreciate just because they know that the many will ultimately benefit from it. But what most people got wrong is that a passion for science is not something developed spontaneously. And I can personally attest to that. You see, before I got to Caltech, I was never really interested in science. I wasn't one of those kids that read nature papers for fun every Sunday and cured cancer in middle school. No, I had a platonic relationship with the subject. I learned my stuff, took my AP tests, and competed in my fair share of science fairs, but I never really cared about any of that. I didn't have a passion for science. No, what I actually cared about were people. And I loved everything about people, even the people that I hated. I loved talking to them, interacting with them, listening to them tell me what they had to say and observing how they acted. I would watch movies just to see the types of people that other types of people can imagine. I had a slight people obsession. Eventually, I became so fascinated with people that I wanted to understand them. So I started studying psychology, and I read everything I could on the subject. I tore through chapters on cognition, I read books on perception, and papers on abnormal disorder. I was that one kid that knew when DSM-5 came out in high school. <laughs> and eventually, psychology wasn't even enough for me. I wanted to understand where it all came from, how thoughts worked, and stuff like that. So I started studying neuroscience. Uh, for those of you who don't know, neuroscience is a very background-heavy subject. So I had to force myself through a lot of classes on chemistry and biology and math. And along the way, I got a little lost. You see, when you do something with a purpose, it has meaning to you. And all of a sudden, science had meaning to me because it was a different way of looking at people. And I started to love it all, to love chemistry, to love math, to love biology, because it all had meaning to me. But I wasn't quite there. The dark illness is a passion for science had failed to metastasize beyond my academic career. I still had some semblance of a life. I still watched movies, talked to people, went places, did things. I still had a life. Science hadn't consumed me yet. <laughs> and then I found out what economics was. And it was really, really awful because I really, really liked it. <laughs> See, somebody stood in front of a room and looked at me and told me that there was a subject that combined everything I loved about my academic career, the psychology, the math, and combined it with everything else that was important in my life, the people, and then told me that I could make money off of it. <laughs> and unfortunately, that is where my story ends, because that marks the time when I stopped having a life and started studying science. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Akshay. Now, we get to the concert band. So, when Bill Bing started working at Caltech, it was 1970 and the Vietnam War was on. He was a trumpet player and he was a brass coach and Bill was quite young. His mother told him that when he grew up, he could not be 
a trumpet player and grow up at the same time. <laughs> so over the years, Bill proved the wisdom of his mother, and he still plays the trumpet, but refuses to grow up. In the, la <laughs> in the last several years, the bands have traveled to perform at Carnegie Hall, at the Great Wall in China, and next year a trip to San Francisco is in the making. In addition to his work with the Caltech bands, Bill teaches and plays the trumpet. His former students have performed with the Duke Ellington Orchestra, Green Day, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Big Real Fish, and many other groups and ensembles. Bill is a true anomaly. Being a brass player and a vegetarian. <laughs> but he says he ate enough hamburgers before he became a vegetarian for two lifetimes. <laughs> he still can't pass a cow without apologizing. <laughs> Bill Bing and the concert band.
I wasn't going to say anything, but then again, those of you who've seen me in concerts in the past know that I can't possibly resist <laughs> having had a chance to talk to so many wonderful people and friends, audience members who've been coming to these concerts for so many years. In particular, I'd like to thank my family who've put up with, put, put up with me for all these years playing on my trumpet and then having to listen to the baton, which has been driving them crazy for years. Uh, actually, leaving Caltech, uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, I was very depressed. I've been thinking about this. And uh, teaching at Caltech is a humbling experience with so many Nobel Prize winners. You know, you go into the Athenaeum, the faculty club, and there are all these Nobel Prize winners and brilliant people. And I read early on that if you study music, you're twice as likely to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so all these years later, I've been waiting and waiting, and recently, <laughs> They told me that they don't give Nobel Prizes in music. <laughs> so I feel a little bit better. This evening has been amazing. Starting off with a trumpet fanfare like that with the greatest players in the world, the nicest people in the world. It's one thing to be able to play an instrument well, but it's another thing to remain a good person when you play it as well as they do. And they have managed to do that. And for that, it's, uh, they deserve a prize. Um, there's so many great things about teaching at Caltech, uh, but I have to put number one, it has to be the students. And, and uh, there can be no second guessing about that experience. Those of us who have been teaching here for a long time and only a few years, we get it. It's, it's a really special place, and not just because there are a lot of brilliant people, and that's true, of course, but they're also just really down-to-earth, nice people. At first, I was terrified just to be able to go, be in the same room with some of these people. And years later, I'm still terrified to be in the same room with some of these people. <laughs> but, I've, but I'm getting better at it. So uh, we're going to continue now. The person who is really responsible for putting, uh, getting us here tonight is Dr. Paul Asimo. Uh, Paul, uh, at the beginning of this year, said, you know, we've been to Carnegie, and we've played at the Great Wall and Disney Hall, but Ambassador Hall is one of the great halls in the country, and uh, what do you say we do that? And thanks to Paul, we're here tonight celebrating the arts at Caltech. So Paul, I'm gonna give the baton over to you, and he's gonna play a piece by Elliot Deutsch. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about it. Doc, there he is. First, I'm gonna sneak up. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. So, in honor of Bill's retirement, a number of members of the band got together and commissioned an original work for band. The composer is Elliot Deutsch. Elliot got his start in music as one of Bill's trumpet students, not all that many years ago. And so it was very fitting that we were able to commission a work from him. And what he did with the commission is extremely clever. He took a number of exercises that Bill wrote for trumpet, then published in the Bing book, and uh, Fundamentals for Brass, his methods for young brass players. He took the Bill's themes and worked them up into a full symphonic treatment. They were called originally the Lyric Endurance Etudes, and now what we have is the Lyric Endurance Suite. Your program says Lyric Endurance Symphony, but we won't be going on quite that long. <laughs> so this is the world premiere performance. The commission and the performance are dedicated to my friend and my mentor and the man who has allowed me to stand up in front of his band for 25 years and wave my arms, Bill Bing.
Yay, Elliot. Woo! Yeah. So, I guess, hold on a second, I gotta tell the stage crew something. So in deciding what to play for my final piece, I thought Hindemith, Bach, <laughs> Mozart, some of my favorite composers. And then I thought, well, what kind of an experience do I want to remember uh, as I look back on my years at Caltech? And, uh, and what do I want the audience to really enjoy and go home feeling good about besides everything that's happened all evening? And I thought, Juggler. <laughs> what else? You know, what could possibly follow all this amazing and beautiful music and theater and art that has been uh, presented this evening? And I thought, juggler. <laughs> now, I happen to have had in the ensemble a juggler of world renown. He graduated from Occidental College and went on to join one of the world's famous juggling troops. And I asked him if he'd come back and, and, and juggle for us one more time. And so, this is what I want you to remember when you think of me.
You're going to stay here. You're going to stay here and do something. All right. Uh, thank you all so very much for coming out and supporting the performing and visual arts and keeping the arts alive at Caltech. I'd like to introduce to you the Vice President of Student Affairs and the rest of the PVA colleagues, uh, Joe Shepard. I don't know how I'm going to top the juggling act. Well, that was a wonderful evening, hasn't it been, folks? I'd just like to thank the faculty and the staff of PVA for working with the students and all the members of the community for help putting this on. It's been a long time in the making, and they've done a wonderful job. Thank you very much. But the most important thing that I'm here to do tonight is to thank Bill and Dolores for <clears throat> the wonderful legacy that they've left in terms of a vibrant mu music program that forms such an important part of the student experience at Caltech. I'm hoping that all the supporters of the music and art programs at Caltech will join me in thanking Bill and Dolores. So, I don't think you'll forget this night anytime soon, but just so you can remember that, in all the years, we would like to present you with this plaque, which reads, with sincere gratitude to Dolores and Bill Bing for your joyous and steadfast commitment to the thousands of musician scientists you've nurtured, mentored, and inspired. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you everybody, good night.